After the atomic bomb helped bring the Second World War to an end in 1945, an extensive atomic testing program was started at Bikini and any Weetok Atolls in the Marshall Islands of the Pacific Ocean. This powerful weapon needed to be studied by the military to better understand how it could be used in their arsenal. Testing in the Pacific was expensive and time consuming. All of the personnel, materials, and supplies had to be transported thousands of miles to the remote locations. By the end of 1948, only five tests had been conducted. A top secret study known as Project Nutmeg was commissioned to look for a testing area in the continental United States, but no selection of a location was made until world events changed the priorities. The Cold War had sharply divided world powers. The Soviet Union had blockaded Berlin in 1948. In 1949, the Soviets demonstrated that they also had the atomic bomb. And in 1950, the Korean War started. The need to conduct tests on a faster turnaround schedule was clearly established. The whole crew, the AEC, Los Alamos, and Homes and Arbor Creek, got together and went over the various sites. That was the most classified thing I've ever worked on, because anybody even thinking of putting an atomic test in the United States had to be out of his mind. It was, just, it was it was tough to believe at the time, and it's still tough to believe. The Alamogordo White Sands Test Range in New Mexico, Dugway Proving Ground in Utah, Pamlico Sound, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, and the Las Vegas Bombing and Gunnery Range in Southern Nevada were identified as potential locations for the Continental Test Site. The Southern Nevada site led the field because of the low population density and because this site was already under government control. Scientists also liked the area due to the dry, warm weather, and it could easily be protected from penetrators. The Atomic Energy Commission recommended what later became known as the Nevada Proving Ground. President Harry Truman approved the establishment of the site northwest of Las Vegas on December 18, 1950. And on January 27, 1951, the first atmospheric test was detonated over Frenchman Flat. In an 11-day period, five tests took place in the Operation Ranger series, ranging in size from 1 to 22 kilotons. All of these devices were dropped from B-50 bombers that flew out of Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. When that test series ended, in early February, the Atomic Energy Commission initiated plans to expand the facilities at the Nevada Proving Ground. When we first started the test site in 1951, one of the engineers that I was, uh, still lives yet today, uh, was involved in building the beginning of the Nevada test site. Uh, they had to build the two cafeterias, building 110 and 112, and uh, building uh, 101, and I, as I remember, seven dormitories for the women, and I don't know, eight or 10 dormitories for the men to live in. Uh, he was given the opportunity to come out to the test site as, and get all that done in 120 days. And his comments later to me was that uh, I spent more money in overtime than on what, I, what the original award of the contract was. Initially, the Nevada Proving Ground was about 680 square miles, but several additions over the years brought it to its current size of 1,375 square miles, roughly the size of the state of Rhode Island. Live radio and television broadcasts from the test site first took place on April 22, 1952, from a location which became known as News Knob. Walter Cronkite and Bob Constantine were among those invited to witness and report to the nation on the early morning atomic test. Operation Tumbler Snapper was conducted in Nevada during the spring and summer of 1952, a total of eight shots. Some of these tests used towers to provide a controlled height of burst for the device. The towers were as high as 700 feet and were used to replace the airdrops that had been the earlier means of delivery. When the tower, the 700-footer, was built, it was the tallest structure west of the Mississippi. They didn't say building because it really wasn't building, the tallest structure. nice thing about the towers is most of the time they had elevators on them so you didn't have to climb them. 
In the spring of 1953, Operation Upshot Knothole included a series of civil effects tests to evaluate the effects of nuclear detonations on civilian communities. The Federal Civil Defense Administration constructed a typical American community complete with houses, utility stations, automobiles, furniture, appliances, food, and mannequins placed in the houses at the time of the test. A variety of construction materials were used to provide data on how different structures would react to the test. Also included in the 1953 test series was the use of a 280 millimeter cannon to fire a 15 kiloton nuclear shell on Frenchman Flat. This test, codenamed Grable, was the only time a nuclear artillery shell was ever fired. Many members of the U.S. Congress came to the test site to witness this historic event. For the first four years, the Nevada testing area was known by a variety of names. But by the end of 1954, the Nevada test site was the name of choice. In 1955, Operation Teapot included the last airdrops of nuclear weapons at the Nevada test site and the conclusion of military troops being stationed at Camp Desert Rock. At its peak, nearly 6,000 troops took part in this testing program. Various shots at the test site uh, in Operation Teapot it was uh, usually uh, most of them was at 4.30 in the morning. We did have a few that was in daylight hours, but it was an all-night uh, effort to, you know, and you'd be up uh, from, uh, you work all day and then you'd basically work all night and hopefully the shot would go the next morning at uh, 4.30. And unfortunately, uh, that didn't always happen. The weather didn't cooperate. And so the shot would be postponed at about 4 o'clock in the morning, particularly if it was going to be a 4.30 shot because the winds weren't quite in the right direction. And so then uh, you'd go home and uh, get a couple hours sleep and you'd work all day again and do the same thing over the next night. And I've seen that happen as high as 14 days in a row. Balloons were used for the first time at the site to provide detonation platforms in the 1957 Operation Plum Bob series. Also, recognizing that atmospheric testing would probably be banned soon, the United States began experimenting with underground nuclear tests. The Saturn event in August was the first tunnel detonation, and in September, the Rainier event was the first detonation contained underground. October 1958 was an extremely busy time at the site. 29 tests were conducted during that month before the initiation of a moratorium on testing that had been declared by President Eisenhower. The Soviet Union also stopped testing in November of that year. That moratorium lasted less than three years as the Soviets unexpectedly resumed testing in September of 1961 with a series of 59 detonations between September 1st and the end of 1961. The United States began a series of tests on September 15th and in 1962 an all-time high of 98 nuclear tests were conducted in that one year in the Pacific and at the Nevada test site. The increased year-round testing schedule made it necessary to establish the Nevada Operations Office of the Atomic Energy Commission that officially opened in Las Vegas in March of 1962. The 100th atmospheric test on July 17, 1962, was also the last atmospheric test at the test site. I remember in the uh, when I first came here and and when atmospheric tests were going on, I would, I lived in a duplex in North Las Vegas, and I would uh, wake up my, my wife and, and our two kids at the time who were very tiny, and we'd go out and sit on the front lawn at our duplex and, and wait till four or five in the morning for the test uh, that I knew was going to be conducted out at the test site and just watch in amazement at, you know, 90 miles away the sky would light up as if it were daylight uh, for just a few, just a second or so, but very brilliantly daylight from, from the test that was going off 90 miles away. And, 
and uh, and that was big big entertainment in Las Vegas at that time. The major thrust behind the nuclear tests had been to aid in the development and proof testing of nuclear weapon designs and to measure the effects of nuclear detonations on a wide variety of military and civilian targets. The Plowshare program studied how peaceful uses of the tremendous energy created by nuclear detonations might benefit large engineering projects. We spent <coughs> time in the 60s uh, doing lots of different kinds of tests that ranged from uh, weapons tests to, uh, to the early plowshare tests. And uh, in, in fact, the, f the very first uh, nuclear device that I worked on, uh, actually put together, assembled with my own two hands was, uh, was sedan, which I always thought was not a bad way to get into the business. Uh, took it out and installed it and then uh, uh, went out a few days, a day or so later, and up to a place above the CP called the monastery to, uh, to watch the test. And I, uh, I remember what a, what a spectacular thing that was to watch, a big, uh, just sort of the flat desert and then a big bubble, huge bubble coming up out of the desert and, uh, and then big tongues of fire coming out of the bubble and then it burst on open very, spectacular and I've always been kind of proud of the fact that that was sort of the way that I got these hands in that in that business. During the 22 years that the plowshare program was active a total of 27 tests consisting of 35 detonations were conducted at the Nevada test site, New Mexico and Colorado. With the advent of the underground testing program in 1961 came the need for uh, deep vertical shafts. These could either be accomplished in one of two methods, either conventional mining methods, uh, which was expensive, it was slow, and it was hazardous, or uh, big hole drilling. And in 1961, the state of art of big hole drilling was such that you could achieve about a 36 inch diameter shaft to fairly good depths uh, using conventional uh, oil field equipment and techniques. So it was obvious that uh, we had to advance the state of the art for big hole or shaft drilling. So RICO along with uh, uh, the Nevada test site drilling architect engineer, the national labs, the uh, uh, equipment manufacturers set about to do just that. Big hole drilling technology evolved as a direct result of the requirements at the Nevada test site to achieve large diameter holes straight enough to lower test packages up to 200 feet long, several thousand feet underground. By the 1970s, holes up to 12 feet in diameter were being drilled in a single pass using flat bottom bits and methods developed to meet the needs of the testing program at the Nevada test site. RICO uh, drilled nearly 600 of these shafts at diameters up to 12 feet and depths uh, in excess of 5,000 feet for a total of more than 1 million lineal feet or about 200 miles. Now the vertical emplacements uh, very drama changed dramatically over the years. In the uh, early 1960s, uh, the, the shots and the diagnostics were fairly simple. Uh, you might have a...